TAIs for your fellow and friend and ally has agreed to, to introduce you, Jonathan, and moderate the conversation. If I may say for, for my small part though, Danielle, may I, our associate publisher, Danielle, without affiliations, but just so we have an overview for people who are with us, a few still joining in the next couple of minutes, but Danielle, would you be good enough to just read us the lists of those who are with us or joining or joining momentarily? Absolutely, always. Um, so tonight we have among us Gabe Schoenfeld, Jacqueline Deal, Nicole Penn, Constanza Steltzmuller, Richard Aldis, Sydney Lipset, David Kramer, Giselle Donnelly, Shadi Hamid, Jack James, Arch Puddington, Leslie Blakey, Marion Blakey, Andrew Albertson, Susan Garment, Alex Clapp, MJ Crawford, Adrian Pomescu, uh, Tom Melia, Patrick Chamorel, Seth Cropsey, Mike Fox, Jeffrey Cabaservice, Jacqueline Dicholet, Michael Mandelbaum, Steve Lagerfeld, Julianne Schaub, and Luke Phillips. I, I hope I didn't miss anybody, but if I did, please feel welcome to introduce yourselves over to Matt as well. Uh, Danielle, thank you very much. And Craig, what a group you have for you and your speaker. Well, thank you, Jeff, for giving us this wonderful platform. Thank you, Charles and Danielle. It's really great. So, Jonathan, um, I can't think of many writers that have written about as many different topics as you have. Uh, I think the first book of yours that I was given before I met you was Out Nation, which is still one of the best books on the culture of Japan. Then there was Kindly Inquisitors about uh, political correctness on campuses. Uh, you did your book on gay marriage in 2004 your autobiography later on, and you've even written a book to make old people like me feel good about getting old. But one of the kind of constant themes throughout your work has been a concern, maybe even an obsession, with the dysfunction in the American government and in the American political process. Uh, the first contribution of this was in 1994, Demosclerosis, where you went after the evil special interests that you thought were clogging up the system. And then, you know, you go fast forward to political realism in 2015, which the subtitle is How Hacks, Machines, Big Money, and Backroom Deals Can Strengthen Democracy and a lot of your recent pieces in Atlantic and elsewhere that have questioned the way that presidential candidates are selected through the primary process and so forth. So to, to start tonight's conversation, how did you get from seeing interests as the problem facing democracy and democratic institutions to a position where you seem to advocate for a more, I don't know, elite, less transparent approach to politics as a means for protecting democracy. Hi, everybody. Uh, that's quite a question. But before we go there, there's so many friends on. I can't see you all. Um, I only get like the, the 25 greatest hits in there. But there's some folks on here I, I haven't seen in ages and I'm really happy to, to catch up with. Um, and uh, thank you all for coming. So. Uh, this is fun. My marching orders are, you know, just say a few words to get us started and keep it short. And that's what I'll do. Um, Craig asked me this question, though, which for a writer like me, I'm a, I'm a journalist, I'm not a PhD, and I've written about, you know, a zillion things. And something I don't get the chance to do is reflect on the continuities or lack of continuities in my work over now a period of gosh, 35 years. The first Atlantic cover article was, what, 1989. Um, so, yeah, there looks like there's been a change. And um, it's interesting to think about what's happened on my journey. So, um, first big book on politics and government was called Demosclerosis, subsequently revised, retitled as Government's End. And it made the argument that Greg alluded to earlier, which is the government, not just in the US, but in all, in all advanced 
democracies are losing the capacity to adapt. And that's not necessarily just because of what goes on inside government. It's because per the theories of a famous economist uh, named Mansur Olson, democratic societies accumulate interest groups over time. And as they form, they secure benefits for themselves in the forms of subsidies and programs. And once these are in place, they're almost impossible to get rid of. And each makes its claim on the budget, the public purse, the regulatory space, they don't go away. So they accumulate and gradually you run out of space for new stuff because you've got so much legacy stuff. And I argued this is a long-term chronic process and it's not tragic. It is manageable, but you do have to manage it. And the notion of demosclerosis was a play on eurosclerosis or arteriosclerosis. But this is a gradual chronic thing. Um, some of you may have read that book. I think in terms of um, within its sort of the four, the four corners of the framework it laid out, it's held up well. Nothing has come along that has debunked it. But some other things happened between then and now that made it pushed it lower on the priority list. So demosclerosis was written at a period, it came out in 1994 uh, on the eve of the Republican Revolution and at the tail end of what turned out to be a kind of golden age of government functionality, which I would argue begins in 1964, 1965, when Judge Smith is uh, removed from chairmanship of the House Rules Committee and that unplugs the civil rights bills and a lot of other things for a period of about 30 years when Congress really works well. Um, it addresses a lot of problems, it's very functional, it has distinguished people there who know what they're doing. And then long 1994, that begins to change with the Gingrich Revolution and much that comes after. In the 1990s, I spent a lot of my time doing same-sex marriage, a very different kind of thing. And then when I kind of swung back to look back in government in the early, you know, around 2011 or so, um, I began to feel alarmed because we were seeing a very different kind of problem. It wasn't that the old chronic problem had gone away, but we were now seeing something that looked like acute failure, less like arteriosclerosis and more like a stroke or a heart attack. In 2011, a big budget deal was put together. It would have been, it would have been good. It would have done a, a lot about the deficit. It included some entitlement changes and some tax increases and some spending cuts. Uh, leadership on both sides and the White House wanted to do it. They could not get it through. It was vetoed by a minority um, in the Republican Party. If it had gone to the floor, there was a majority for it, but it never got there. 2013, the government shuts down, not because a majority of Congress wanted it to shut down, but again, because a small group under the leadership of Ted Cruz was able to make that happen. Same thing happens the same year to an immigration bill for which there would have, for which there was a, a, a majority on the floor. Had that bill passed, I don't think we would have seen the rise of Donald Trump and the anti-immigration movement. So I begin to notice again and again that, that, that politics is having trouble organizing itself. It's not just that we're polarized, that that is happening. It's not just that there's disagreement, but even when there are implicit majorities, there are failing to form. They are failing to take shape. And then we start to notice something else, which is the rise of what I call the political sociopath. That is not a psychiatric diagnosis. A political sociopath is a politician who doesn't care about anyone except themselves and doesn't need to care about anyone except themselves. They don't care what other politicians think of them because they're independent for, me for money. They don't care about endorsements. They don't need media or they can get their own and so forth. They don't care if the party loves them or hates them. So these people can set themselves up in politics because you know they want a talk show afterwards or because it's a great platform for self-promotion. They're much less interested in the hard work of regulating and governing. We begin to see more and more of those people come into politics. Those are not people very interested in legislating. And we begin to see Congress losing its legislative chops. But then of course, 2016, 2015, 2016, I will put my cards on the table. Uh, all Trump supporters are very welcome at this conference. Um, I, um, I'm not someone who will denigrate you, but I also feel that his election was a major failure of the kind I'm talking about. Specifically, he was not wanted by a majority of his party. He was not wanted by a majority of the country. He was a political sociopath, in the sense I mean, a renegade operator who is in business for himself 
The system could not stop him. Many wanted to, but it could not. So by about 2016, I start launching the next big idea. I call it political realism. Um, it's not that it supersedes or obviates demosclerosis, but it's a much more immediate short-term problem. It's what happens when a political system gives way to chaos. The core argument is this, that in order for politics to work, organizing has to go on in the background. We have this notion, it's you know voters and they elect candidates and the candidates do stuff and if the voters are unhappy, they kick them out and that's politics. Well, that's wrong. It's been wrong since the founding. You need a whole lot of organizing to go on in the background. And to do that, you need some things to happen. You need to have political parties that can act as long-term institutions that can sort out which candidates belong in which races. It can have a farm system. It can recruit. It can then vet people to see if they're going to be team players. You need to have some privacy so that you can do adult negotiations in public without interest groups blowing you to smither smithereens. You need to have some control as a party of who your nominees are. Thus, for example, the Democratic Party should be in a position to unashamedly favor a Democrat for the Democratic nomination for president. Bernie Sanders, of course, was not a Democrat. He almost won it in 2016. That would have been inconceivable in an earlier time. You need some control over things like money, right? You want some big money brokers who are loyal to the party or loyal to the cause over the long term, who are establishment interests, who can kind of approach a renegade candidate and say, you know, it's going to be a lot harder for you to raise money if you continue to behave the way you're behaving. Uh, you need a seniority system in Congress that will promote people with experience. You need some pork barrel spending. It turns out if you want to do something politically difficult, like cut a big entitlement program, the best political grease for that is, you know, that third runway for the airport in someone's district. That's how the Civil Rights Bill got passed in 1965. Famous story. Um, you, so you need a lot of stuff that if you put it under the ethical microscope, if you single it out, it looks bad, right? It looks like cronyism. It looks, you know, some people say it's corruption. It's big money, backroom deals, smoke filled rooms, all of that stuff. Well, a lot of things have gotten us to where we are. We can talk about them, polarization, rise of social media, um, the atomization of money, all those things I grant you. All of those things are happening. It's, I'm not a monocausal person, but I claim, and a lot of political scientists also claim, um, that part of what's happened is we have systematically over 40 years dismantled most of the mechanisms that we rely on to organize, to allow political professionals to organize politics. And that extends to demonizing the very idea of political insiders, political professionals. Um, well, if you dismantle all the the things that need to be done to do air traffic control in an airport, you cannot be surprised if the planes get snarled, if they begin to crash in midair, if you begin to see behavior that would have been unthinkable for the previous 200 years of American history. So that's what uh, that's where I'm coming from now. Something very interesting is that everything I've told you is political science 101. Somewhat controversial, but not very, but it has not penetrated the popular consciousness, which is still based on the sort of consumeristic model of politics where, you know, it's like the grocery store, you pick your candidate, you go home with your candidate, and then the candidate does what you want as a politician, or then you fire them. It leaves out the entire distribution chain in the middle, all the other stuff that has to happen. So my current job is to try to get the public um, and the reform community to notice all of the stuff that has to happen in the middle and to try to pull back on the jihad against political corruption and to, to argue, or at least to consider, the biggest problem in American politics right now is not corruption, it is chaos, it is dysfunction. Uh, we will see more Trumps, especially in the Republican Party for reasons we can discuss in the future. He won't be the last if the parties are unable to exclude certain kinds of people. Um, we will see more dysfunction in Congress and therefore more passing of power to the presidents and the court if we don't re-empower the systems that let people like Nancy Pelosi do the manipulations they need to do and so forth and so on. So I see myself as kind of a realist in both of these spheres in my career, but sort of segueing from, from chronic care to acute care. Um, 
I guess I guess that's more than enough. Wow. Okay, so uh, this crew of people that come on the TAI calls know how to use the raise your hand, or you can send a note to either Demir or myself or Danielle, and we'll make sure that you get recognized. Uh, let's see, the, there, there was a hand up, Luke? Hi, uh, Jonathan, thank you for uh, being here and making this, uh, this presentation of the corpus of your work and hope you're doing okay in quarantine. Um, I, uh, I was wondering um, what your opinions are on the responsible parties thesis that uh, has come back into vogue in the last two years or so. I believe somebody wrote a, uh, the, uh, there was a book um, on responsible parties uh, uh, for our era written about a year or so ago, and the authors actually wrote a long piece at the American Interest uh, summarizing their argument. Uh, so I was wondering if you could uh, just comment on uh, if stronger parties um, along the lines of what those authors are thinking uh, is uh, part of the political realist solution uh, that you're arguing for. Yeah, uh, thank you. Hi, Luke. It's it's wonderful you're here. I'm, I'm glad to see you and glad you're okay. Um, the Yeah, I'm a fan of that book. So a big chunk of what I've been talking about comes through the political science literature in a conversation that's gone on for about 50 years about American parties. There's only one type of organization in America that even in principle can do the work of the background organizing of politics with a long-term time horizon. And those are the political parties. Um, unlike candidates, they have a more than two to four year time horizon. Um, they have institutional histories. They have brands they need to consider, which tends to make them more responsible in the long run than individuals. They have organizational skills. They have hierarchies. And we have systematically weakened them over the period of the last 50 years. Uh, we have pass regulation after regulation that now makes it, for example, harder for the political parties to raise money than any other entity in politics. Uh, just for example, um, we have made it harder for the state parties, uh, a very important thing in politics to do their job. So yeah, I'm a fan of strengthening political parties institutionally. And then the next thing someone's gonna say, well, we're hyper-partisan, why will that help? So this gets really interesting. I am convinced by the argument that a weird thing that's happened is the weakening of the parties institutionally. That is, as organizations with a past and a present and a future that can hold people responsible and accountable over time, and that can recruit people who are responsible, that can worry about governing, the weakening of those has increased the amount of oxygen available to the hyperpartisan activists and outsiders who rush in to fill that space. It's also increased the ability of extremists to run in primaries. That's a huge part of, I think, what's broken here, the primary process. It's very hard to exclude extremists, hyperpartisans, political sociopaths. The more those people run and get elected, the weaker the party become. The more weaker the parties become, the more those people can run. The more those people get into Congress, the more moderates don't want to run because they don't want to be in that environment and they can't get anything done. So you get in a cycle. Long way of saying, yeah, I, I am a fan of the book you refer to. I'm annoyingly, I can't, is it Grossman? Grossman and somebody? Um, I'm a fan of the book. I'm a fan of the hypothesis. I'm the first to agree there are problems with strong parties. There are problems with every, everything in politics. But right now, the problem is that they're too weak, not too strong. That's especially true on the Republican side. What you've seen on the Democratic side this year is really interesting because um, it showed that old fashioned party insiders actually in the Democratic side can still kind of do their job. Uh, just to clarify, Richard Aldis uh, put the name of the book in the chat. It was uh, Responsible Parties by Ian Shapiro and Francis McCall Rosenbluth. So thank you, Richard, for that. It's a so before we uh, turn to Leslie, I, I just observed that when I first met you in 1993, I was working for Mayor Daley in Chicago, and certainly I'm both a hack and part of a machine. and as I remember, you were not completely approving. So I think it's I think it's good that you've moved along. <laughs> Leslie, your question. 
Yeah, I'm at, yeah, there I am. Uh, yeah, so in this context that you're talking about uh, with um, the, the need for parties and political institutions to be able to do this kind of organizing, uh, and you mentioned Pelosi, but I, I would really love for you to comment a little bit on Mitch McConnell and his approach, which has um, basically been to spend as much time and, and political capital as possible on uh, confirming judges um, as opposed to other, the other business of politics. And it's really, in my experience, seems to have somewhat hamstrung the Senate in terms of trying to get things done. Uh, lots of problems with the Senate, of course. Uh, Mitch McConnell's an interesting character because he is about as close as you can come today to a classic machine politician. Actually, Nancy Pelosi is pretty close to one too. Um, I don't recall, Craig, uh, being disapproving of, of Mayor Daley. I'd certainly never be disapproving of you because um, when I was only 20 years old, I read George Washington Plunkett, The Sage of Tammany Hall. <laughs> he wrote this, wrote this brilliant book, which you should all read. You can read it in two hours and it's hilarious. These are lectures that he gave. He was a Tammany Hall hack and he's explaining the importance of, of machines, political machines, patronage and pork and what he called honest graft, which is the use of bribery to do stuff that the party needs to do, not just to line individuals' pockets. So McConnell is kind of in that mold. Um, he's the guy who does the dirty work of when someone's running for Senate and he thinks the guy's going to be toxic to the majority, he, he drops the hammer. Um, he's good at that kind of thing. And he is someone who I think really only cares about um, three, two or three things. One is preserving his Republican Senate majority, a machine politician's thing that he cares about. Uh, I guess really just two things, that and judges, right? And judges are something that one chamber of Congress can get done in the current environment where you have a largely dysfunctional White House, you have a house in the other party. Um, so it looks like he's staked his entire legacy on building this machine, preserving this machine and turning it over to the confirmation of judges. Um, we might wish it were otherwise, but that seems to be where he's at. Aaron, you're next. Hi, um, I wanted to ask about uh, the phenomenon of establishment politicians supporting many of the disintermediating efforts that uh, you've suggested are a problem for democracy. Um, in particular, I hear a lot of people on the center left disparage the electoral college despite claiming, I think correctly, to think that direct democracy is bad and that some degree of, you know, intermediating representation is good. What do you make of the phenomenon of people within the establishment arguably supporting, at least in rhetoric, things that weaken their ability to do this kind of party politics? That That's such an astute observation, Aaron, and it's something that um, I've, I've done my best to push against. So it turns out if you ask the American public if they want a stronger or weaker role for parties, lots of them want a stronger role. Um, a colleague of mine, Ray LaRage, a political scientist, just did that. Um, he asked the general public, so if you had a certain amount of authority over who nominates candidates, how would you allocate it between professionals on the one hand and the voting public on the other. And it turns out they want to allocate about two thirds of it to the voting public and one third to professionals. This is how America has done it until 2016, first formally through smoke filled rooms and then informally through the invisible primary, which was all the establishment sign offs that party the candidates had to get. And it turns out the public is very comfortable with a significant element of professional input. So who's not comfortable with it? Well, activists and elites like us, because who benefits from a system where professionals and hacks and backrooms are weak? Well, activists, the people who can form groups and put up candidates and create their entire own candidate pipelines for development and recruitment, 
and fund the candidates and push whatever their agendas are and take over the primary process. And people like me, right? The journalists, the writers, the media, the pundits, the people who now get to say, because the old fashioned political professionals aren't the gatekeepers. So we decide who won the debates and who lost the debates. Well, that's, that is great for us. Um, part, of, part of my challenge is to convince people like us that actually what we've done, and in, I, I don't mean to say we've done it cynically. This was well-intentioned reform that was designed or intended to strengthen democracy. This is based on a false theory, but, but part of what I'm out to do is convince at least some of the people on calls like this one to do a rethink. It is, I don't think the public is actually the big problem. Um, I think the problem is more like people like us. I'm so glad you brought that up. It's something I, a point I rarely get to make. No, thank you for your answer. That's great. Fox. Excellent. Michael. Thank you so much. Um, and I first want to- We're great in Back to the Future. <laughs> and underrated in Spin City. Um, <laughs> Though what I did want to say is I'm actually a former student of Ray LaRaja's. And uh, oh. so I definitely enjoyed the piece that the two of you co-wrote a few months back. Um, and I'll preface my question by saying that like many on this call, I've been a professional hack at times. So if the question itself comes off as a bit more partisan, my apologies. But um, it's in reference to your recent piece about the party of George Wallace. And what I'm curious about is what is what was the process where it was a part where George Wallace had his faction. Then at some point in the 80s, you have Lee Atwater, arguably an archetypal hack, leveraging some of these same forces in service of institutional politicians to where we are today. And what is there something that made the modern GOP more vulnerable to this kind of process? Or was it a fluke of timing? Um, so big point first, I, I'd be interested to hear what Jeff Cabot service has to say about all of this because he's written entire books about it. Hi, Jeff. Um, there is an asymmetry between the two parties. Republicans now are more like a populist insurgency with less ability to stop political sociopaths than the Democrats who have more residual capacity, as we've just seen. Um, why did that happen? So a bunch of things happened. One is, have to say this with Michael Fox on the call, Fox News. The rise of Rush Limbaugh and the alternative media establishment, which had a radicalizing influence and which it became very important for politicians to court. You also had the rise of Newt Gingrich, who decreased capacity in Congress um, and bashed government a whole lot and campaigned against government and political insiders. Um, you also have the winner take all primary system on the Republican side, which is what made it possible for Trump to roll up as many delegates as he did as quickly. And it turns out, according to a paper that Ray and, Ray and I think Brian Schaffner is, is no, uh, Zach, Zach Albert just published. Uh, you can find it on FixGov, which is the Brookings blog. So they actually asked Republicans and Democrats about their attitudes uh, toward parties and intermediaries. And it turns out Republicans are more hostile to party intermediation. Interestingly, by the way, um, this may not surprise people on this call, but in the Democratic side, guess who the people are who are most populist and most want direct votes in primaries to prevail? And guess who are the people who are most interested in having an establishment weigh in? You might, you guys might get this right. It's the white college educated activists who are primarily interested in direct voter input and it's African-Americans who are primarily interested in having an establishment say. And that's because African-Americans come up through the ranks. They understand the party as a machine. They are less ideologically driven. Um, the college educated activists tend to run the show. So that's, it's a side note. Um, I'd be curious, others might have, Jeff might have other 
factors that he'd want to add about why Republicans have, have gone the way that they did when they did. I mean, we, we could go on and on about this. Um, and it seems like someone's always coming out with some interesting new angle on things. I would commend to you all Evan Osnos's piece uh, in The New Yorker yesterday uh, about how the Greenwich Republican Party, Greenwich, Connecticut, which had very much been the preserve of moderate, somewhat patrician Republicans in the mold of Prescott Bush, father of George H.W., grandfather of W., um, gave way to being a very Trump-dominated uh, bunch of hedge fund managers. Um, and, you know, I think clearly this is a case where a lot of identities align. The identities of the hedge fund managers in making vast sums of money without any kind of restrictions whatsoever um, from society kind of aligned with the Trumpian uh, urge to get rid of all of these kind of establishment restraints that you're talking about, as, as well as the party restraints. I mean, it's interesting coming together. Um, you know, I don't have the answer to all of this, but what I find interesting is when you look back at the moderate wing of the party that I looked at, um, even when they were confronted with the rise of the conservative movement, they saw it as, okay, here's another faction jostling in this basically factional party. And at some point, we're going to have to let them have a turn and we're going to have to concede something to their preferences. Um, whereas the conservative movement, at least most of the people in it, didn't think that way. Um, they actually thought, we're going to take this over and we're going to run the show and we're not going to tolerate any dissent. And people are either going to get on board or we're going to kick them out. Uh, and the question I have for you, John, is you know, whether, as uh, my colleague Steve Tellis and his uh, uh, co-author Robert Salden put it, um, the future is faction. Um, can the Trumpian movement become actually a factional interest in the party? Can you actually get people like um, you know, Josh Hawley and Tom Cotton and Mitt Romney um, and others kind of actually forming this kind of post-reformicon faction that will horse trade with other less Trumpy factions in the Republican Party, what's left of the moderates, uh, the Mitch McConnell machine politicians, or is there just a nihilistic streak in both the Trump voters and their representatives in Congress where they are going to sort of seek to dismantle anyone who doesn't agree with them, kick them out, even if that means losing elections from now until God knows when. Uh, so am I allowed to say yes? Uh, I'm sorry, and Craig? Go ahead and answer that question. And then we've got three or four others in the queue. All right. Am I, uh, am I going on too long? Should nope. I be more, more nope. clear, concise, and well written? No, yes was perfect. <laughs> so, <laughs> Um, elaborating slightly on, on yes, both of those things are possibilities. Um, the, the article that Michael Fox just alluded to was published the other day in, on Atlantic.com. And it argues that the Trump movement is in fact not a Trump movement. It's another outburst of the George Wallace movement, which is an insurgency, a populist um, white identitarian insurgency that began 50 years ago working class based, um, heavy in the South, but not just in the South, that it popped up, it, it materializes opportunistically, it materialized for Pat Buchanan and Sarah Palin. What it did not do for Trump was manage to take over the party and with it a president, the presidency despite not having a popular majority. Something George Wallace said was possible <clears throat> and he turned out to be right. So where the article ends is with exactly the question you asked, which is a big question. Historically, the Wallace movement has not been wedded to a particular party. Um, Wallace was a Democrat. He also ran as an independent. Buchanan and Palin, of course, Trump are Republicans. It has never been institutionalized. It doesn't have a clear agenda. Wallace didn't have a clear agenda. His agenda was to complain and express resentment similar to Trump. Um, it's hard to know what to horse trade with people whose agenda is to express resentment and class solidarity. So where the article ends is with the question, do, does this group become a standard kind of a faction within the Republican Party? Or do they just continue to be a disruptive presence in American politics that goes hither and yon? and strikes where it can. And the answer is, I don't think we know that yet, but I think what we do know 
I go out on a limb a little on this, but having said that, having seen that this faction, the Wallace vote, has been with us for 50 years and that people like me have grossly underestimated its significance, I reckon it accounts for about 20 to 25% of the American electorate, which is a lot. Now that it's tasted power and it has organization and money, it's gotten stronger, not weaker. And in some form or other, we're going to be living with this as a major force in American politics for the indefinite future. Okay, Suzanne Gardner. Feeling, feel better now? No. <laughs> yeah, your turn, Suzanne. You're muted, I think. Uh, you're still muted. You're okay. muted. Now okay. you're not muted. So how do we get back? Or can we get back? Um, is that the whole question? It's yeah. a nice and short question. It's the whole <clears throat> Uh, well, that could be a long conversation. So a few bullet point items, and then I can refer you out to stuff I'm writing, other people writing. First of all, a lot of what got broken can be fixed in ways that are not super difficult. Uh, you should allow the parties to raise, in my view, unlimited sums of money for their candidates and then coordinate with their candidates. Make them the clearing houses for money so the candidates and donors alike have to go to the parties for approval. Um, there's a lot of stuff you can do um, without even changing a line of law. There is nothing in law that says parties used to have to choose their nominees through popularity contests only. They could require candidates to get endorsements in order to qualify. Uh, they haven't done that, but they could. They can do that any way they want to. So it's simply a matter of willpower in many ways for them to get back into the business of vetting candidates. Um, a lot can be done to strengthen the state parties, to untie the hands of the parties um, in terms of the regulations that they've faced. Uh, I've written about that with Ray. You'll find that on the couple, couple papers at Brookings. Um, you can change the, the rules again. You don't need to change a line of law. These are congressional rules. So that you reduce the number of roll call votes, which are used to weaponize amendments so that everyone has to vote on these silly things all the time. You just have a roll call vote on the final bill. Um, you could reduce the amount of transparency in the negotiating process so that it's easier for these people to meet and work stuff out. You could reinstate um, earmarks. That's by no means a magic bullet, but it would be a step in the right direction. Uh, that allows you to put stuff in bills that helps things get through. It gives congressional leaders uh, more toys to play with when they try to assemble majorities. You could make the appropriations committee stronger instead of weaker. I could go on and on. So there's absolutely no shortage of specific things that could happen. If you asked, if you pin me down and said, what's the most important single thing to reform? I would say it's the candidate nomination process. When it's dominated by activists, extremists, and political sociopaths as it is now, you're gonna drive moderate candidates from the race and elect people who are less and less competent. Um, so you need to introduce an element of what my colleague at Brookings, Elaine Kmart calls peer review. And that's where party professionals, hacks, political careerists get more of a say, not exclusive say, the voters still need to be number one, but these people need to be partners in assessing candidates, organizing the field and have more say earlier in the process, not super delegates at the very end. So that's all right. that stuff. Now, the big thing, okay? So I did same-sex marriage. When I started that in 1995, people said, don't even think about it, it's ridiculous, it'll never happen. Here we are. The way that happened was changing the way people thought about marriage and society and gay people. But the first thing that had to happen before the specific efforts was to reorient people's thinking. So the big job here is to reduce the hostility, especially among the class of people like us to political intermediation so that our knees don't always jerk in the direction of more transparency is always better and small donors are better than big donors. And we've got to reform the rules to make it even harder for the DNC to help Hillary Clinton if that's what they want to do. If we can change our mindset, everything else, gets much easier. Okay, Nicole Penn and then Jackson, 
Nicole. Hi, Jonathan. It's good to see you. Um, so I was hey. wondering if, if you could uh, draw in some arguments from Lee Drutman's recent book, Breaking the Two-Party Doom Loop, and I'm particularly interested in how he um, he argues that the nationalization of our politics has a lot to do with um, the polarization of the parties. And how do we put that genie back in the bottle when, you know, it's not fun or interesting or there's not a lot of incentives to get really invested in, you know, the political debates that people actually know something about school boards, you know, what to do at the local level. Um, but it is really fun to go on Twitter or follow that viral Facebook thread about, um, you know, a drag time story hour in Philadelphia when you live in Arizona. So, you know, how do we, um, do you have any cultural arguments? Because you've, you've talked a lot about some very specific changes at the political institutional level, but what do we do about the cultural forces that are making it impossible for things like, uh, you know, liberal Republicans and blue dog Democra Democrats to exist anymore? Um, <clears throat> again, a lot to say about Lee's book. This is Lee Drutman. He's at New America Foundation. Um, to our eternal regret, we lost him from Brookings. Um, he wrote a, a book arguing for going to a system with proportional representation and multi-party democracy. He believes the two parties are irreparably broken. So he wants to go with something more like uh, Italy or Israel. Uh, that's a whole different argument. I think he's wrong about that. But I also think it's the wrong conversation and that given the system we have now, that increasing the ability of the parties we have to do their job as parties of doing political organizing is more important. Um, so Nicole, I don't pretend to have easy answers to problems like social media and the polarization of society as a whole. Um, but I think the, I, I, there are aspects of this that can be addressed and I just mentioned some of them. One is there's still a lot of mo moderate voters out there. I happen to look at the, the uh, Pew figures on polarization and although, um, so the American public used to be hill shaped with the big lump in the middle. It was, it was a bell curve and, and people were mostly moderate in the middle. Now the curve is flattened, but it's not bimodal. It's not two mountains that are apart in the, gen in the, in the public in general. Um, it's just flatter. There's not as many people in the middle and more toward the edges. So where's this bimodal distribution, these two mountains side by side? I wish I could show you the picture that don't overlap. It's in the political activist community. It's in people who are highly in politically engaged and they are very polarized and they are the people running for office. They are the people voting in the primaries. They are the people who are vetoing the moderates. Um, if you can do some of the other things we talk about, you can present moderate voters with more moderate choices, for example, or more pragmatic choices. One of my favorite sayings is Mo Fiorina, political scientist, who points out there can be no moderate voters if there are no moderate candidates. Um, so in answer to your question, there's no magic bullet solutions to fixing the culture and polarization is another conversation and I'm terribly worried about it. But the political system right now, the loss of intermediation has made it harder to build coalitions within the polarized climate and that exacerbates it further. Jackson, your turn. Jonathan, I wanted to ask you about um, two things. First of all, how do you see state politics fixing, uh, figuring into your analysis um, uh, in the sense of political leadership in individual states? They've got to have a role here and they're going to be asymmetric a bit, but I'm just wondering how do you see that uh, factor uh, beginning to get at the knot of the problem that you've identified? And I wonder if I could just, Craig will uh, forgive me for asking this question, it's a little bit out of bounds, but um, I spent a lot of time in Germany and um, I was curious as to how you see, looking at Europe, any lessons that we could use here from, our, yeah, from their perspective. Question. Well, question number two is easy to answer because I see Constanza Stelzenmiller on the, uh, uh, oh, she's looking up like a deer in the headlights. Yeah, that's, that's you, Constanza. She is an expert on, on this topic in, uh, in Europe specifically. Uh, and I'd love to hear what she has to say about 
part two of your question. Part one, you know, I haven't done a lot of work <clears throat> studying the state level issues. I don't think they're fundamentally different, though I think the, the lower you get in the food chain, the closer you get to the ground, the more pragmatic politics becomes just because you're more and more worried about filling potholes and stuff like that. But the only state level aspect of this that I've really had the opportunity to explore has been understanding what's happened to the state parties, which are a fundamental player in American politics, almost completely neglected by policymakers and students of political science alike. But these are the people, state and county party officials, who are going around saying, hey, uh, Jackson, uh, why don't you run for such and such? And Jackson says, I'd rather run for governor. And they say, no, you're not ready. Um, they're doing all that hard background work of organizing and recruiting, and they have been substantially weakened, but that's not really addressing the question you're answering. So I guess I, guess I don't really know yet. Um, it's a great question and I should explore it. Richard Aldous. Hi, Jonathan, thank you for, um, for such an interesting talk. Um, I'm struck as well with Jeffrey Cabber service on the call, how so many of the themes that we're kind of talking about were preempted or raised in that wonderful book, The Guardians. Um, but uh, my, my question is a, is a historical one, not a political one, that, um, you know, I, I wonder, I mean, you talk about George Wallace and Buchanan and, and even Sarah Palin, but of course, none of those people ever won. And I wonder if, you, if we underestimate the fact that uh, Donald Trump was running against what was generally considered to be the best political field for a Republican uh, primary for uh, kind of a long time, that he defeated the, one of the best political machines in the, uh, in the Clintons, and that it seems to me in some ways, just from a historical, not from a political perspective, to dismiss him as a psychopath almost seems to me to be the easy option. Um, well, you certainly won't find me dismissing him because he's president of the United States. So he's a fundamental driver of this conversation. Uh, and I'd remind you when I use, say political sociopath, I'm, I'm not meaning it as a psychiatric diagnosis, I'm meaning it as someone um, who's in a particular kind of political position. Uh, the question is, why did Trump win against a strong field? And the answer is that the party, the Republican Party, um, was, it, it was a deeply fractured field, as you know, and the party was not able to unite around an alternative. And even if it was able to unite around an alternative, it had, it had become too weak institutionally to be able to organize around that alternative. So essentially, its hands were tied. I like to remind people that Trump did not win a majority of Republican votes in any Republican primary until basically the field was down to one other person. What he did manage to do is divide the rest of the field because if you were someone who is interested in profoundly disrupting politics and doing what and, and saying the things that Trump said, there was there was only one of him. We have a long tradition, and you asked as a historical matter. We have a long tradition in American politics of political sociopathy dating back to Aaron Burr, um, and we've also had a long tradition of party gatekeepers keeping those people away from the ultimate levers of power. Example one, Henry Ford in the 1920s, who was a very Trump-like figure at that point, anti-Semitic, racist, um, kind of totalitarian, uh, floated a bid for presidency. There was a mass movement to support him, actually, and both parties shut him down. Basically, they said, well, we won't let you do that. They controlled the nomination. 1976, the Democratic Party um, cleared the field in Florida the Florida primary, they could actually do this then. They could say to a bunch of candidates who were not named Jimmy Carter, we'd like you to sit out the Florida primary so that Carter can consolidate the anti-Wallace vote. That got Wallace out of the race. Otherwise, he might have won the Democratic nomination. Um, 1996, Lyndon LaRouche ran on the Democratic ticket or tried to. Um, the, Dem the DNC, um, what was Fowler's first name, Craig? Uh, DNC Chairman Fowler was able, was in a position in 1996 yeah. to say basically, oh no, you don't. So that's what changes. 
by 2016, no one is in a position to do that. And it's not even clear anyone wants to do that because we've so deeply imbibed this, um, this vocabulary and this philosophy that the people don't need any help at all. Forgetting that the people who vote in primaries are not the people. They're a small and unrepresentative sliver of the people. The share of Republicans who voted in the Republican presidential primaries is on the order of 12%. So you're not getting representation there. You're getting faction and capture. And that's, I think, what we need to worry about, restoring some of the buffers against faction and capture. I wanted to say, by the way, in um, quick response, I, I kind of ducked Jackson's question about Europe um, because someone better qualified is here should she choose to weigh in. But I'd also point out one of the reasons that we know that it's not just the reforms um, that I criticize that have caused this problem in America is we're seeing versions of this problem in other countries. Uh, the Jeremy Corbyn phenomenon in the UK, for example. Um, the rise of uh, two very different populist parties in Italy and so forth. So we know that a lot of what's going on here is not within the sort of four corners of, of political policy, political reform, political structure per se. There are other things going on and I, I never want to try to simplify away from that. Okay, great. Shadi? Hi, uh, you? can you hear me fine? Yeah, Perfect. hi, Shadi. Uh, hi, hi, Jonathan. Um, nice yeah, to see so you. So I have, uh, yeah, you too. Um, so I have uh, maybe uh, a, slight, a purposely provocative question, mostly because I'm just curious to hear how you'll respond. Uh, we know we can count on you for that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. <laughs> and I, I, st I had to step out, so I apologize if you covered this at some point, but um, so, I guess the first thing is um, if, uh, if a control domination process similar to the one that the, Dem the Democratic Party has, if that process produces Joe Biden as, as our candidate, isn't that sort of self-negating? Doesn't that, I mean, like undermine the premise from the very start? And then, but like more importantly, and this gets to my, like the br my broader um, question, which maybe is more about what our starting principles are in this debate. Why is having a competent or moderate candidate the goal in the first place? And I guess the answer to that might seem obvious for those who already believe that competence and moderation are inherently good things, but there are a lot of people who don't start with that starting premise. So if we kind of remove ourselves from the starting premise and of course everyone on a TAI panel presumably believes in competence so I guess it doesn't really apply to the people on this call except maybe for one or two of you um, who I'm looking at in, in the squares but um, yeah I guess like, I'm, like how do you make the case that competency and moderation should be should be the goal to people who don't share your starting premises? Um, thank you both both wonderful provocations. So Joe Biden, <clears throat> various people on this call will have different views about, about Vice President Biden, and I'd be interested in hearing some of them. My own view is that a party's job in choosing a nominee is to find someone who will A, win the election, um, and B, unite the party. Um, it's hard to find someone who will do both of those things. It seems to me the party made a rational calculation and I would argue a correct calculation that Joe Biden was much better able to do those things than say Bernie Sanders, who I think would have divided the party and lost the election. Um, now, Joe Biden might lose the election anyway, but the starting point is those two things. Um, and so they made a very traditional decision. We'll see how it works out for them. But I, for one, as you can guess, was relieved to see um, that, that the party, party regulars um, in particular, um, voters in South Carolina to begin with were able to join ranks. And then, then you saw behavior by other candidates that amounted to clearing the field. Um, the second question, the second point, so competence and moderation, yes and no. I'm an unapologetic believer that governing is really, really hard. 
much, much harder than brain surgery and competence is really important, especially at times like this. And that it is not good for a country to fetishize amateurism and authenticity at the expense of competence and capacity. And I'm afraid that that's what we've done, especially a lot of, a lot of voters, especially a lot of primary voters. Moderation, not so much. Um, the point here is not to elect moderates preferentially. The point here is that I and a lot of people argue that the system as it is now, especially the primary nominating process, discriminates against moderates. So the point here is not to overrepresent moderates, it's to correctly represent moderates. There should be more moderate choices than there are. And if there are, I think more moderate voters would then come out and vote for them. But, but Jonathan, what, sorry, one, one very quick thought, just very quickly though, I mean, what, what would you say to those who don't think that competence should be prioritized over other objectives if you were trying to convince them? to get on board with your with that's your That's a good view. question. No one's, no one's, that's never arisen in a conversation before. I guess you're kind of <laughs> describing, you're kind of describing the insurgent vote, the Wallace vote, the burn it all down vote. We see some of that on the left and some of it on the right. Um, and I'd have to think about whether those people are persuadable. And maybe the answer is they're not, but in a capable political system, they're a minority. They're not even that large of, of a minority. Um, and you try to integrate them into the system to some extent. Um, you don't want to muzzle them. You, you don't want to silence, silence them or disenfranchise them, but you also want to be able to build a competent system around them. So I, guess, to, I'd, I, mean, I guess I'd say that. To, to follow up on Chaddy's point, isn't, isn't the point that many of those voters who voted in 2016 felt that the technocrats had not been competent, that they had not delivered competence for for those voters? Um, maybe. I think they were more worried about uh, the financial crash and the bailout and immigration. Um, so I'm and not sure it was an issue crash, of competence the, the, the per financial, se. But the financial crash was incompetence, wasn't it? I mean, it was, it was the system breaking down plus globalization breaking down. All of these things that as I say, I'm, I'm not making any political points here, but I mean, it seems to me that those voters felt that that very, those technocratic answers, globalization, competence, all of those things that, that we're talking about here, that somehow they had failed them, that they had not delivered for them. And that that was one of the reasons why many, for example, traditionally democratic blue collar voters who would not normally have voted Republican or would not normally have voted conservative, for example, uh, in the UK, um, delivered victories both for the Republican Party in 2016 and the Conservative Party in 2019. Um, fair point. My, my own reading of populism is that it is not primarily about competence. It's about grievance. Um, but that's a fine point which we can debate separately. Um, I guess the reason I exist is to make the argument that competence and experience um, and a long-term view matter in government. And by the way, I don't necessarily mean technocratic competence. I don't mean bureaucrats who know a lot of stuff. I mean, people who've been around long enough, you know, in a state legislature or a governorship so that they understand how to build a coalition and make a deal and how to legislate. And they feel like they'll be in the system long enough so that they need to be accountable for the results and not just for the one vote. Um, and that they have goals in life that are larger than, you know, getting a talk radio show. But I guess I'm here to argue to the world that we have undervalued those things. And that the voters who think the answer is to insert more and more amateurs um, on the grounds that, that they will somehow be more representative and more authentic um, are making things worse, not better. I guess I just have to win that argument. Okay, Steve, you're up next. You're on mute. Yep, oh, unmute. Okay. There we go. Hi, hey, Steve. Uh, good to see Long you. time no see. Yeah, really. Um, and I'm only kind of seeing you. Uh, you're very small. <laughs> uh, my question goes back uh, uh, 10 Does that steps. help? in this conversation. Um, 
you know, I couldn't agree with you more about the need uh, to renovate and restore the political parties and their their functioning. But when you talk about it, you talk about their elite level function, which is really important and is a thing that we care about. But yeah, yeah. traditionally, the, the, you know, the parties were built on the backs of foot soldiers who did, did who belonged, who did the work, um, who participated, who took their cues from party leaders and not necessarily elected ones, but, uh, you know, their precinct captain or whoever. Um, those people uh, were, number one, people from organizations like labor unions and so on, many of which are much diminished now. Um, or two, you know, people who had other incentives for participating in the life of a political party. Um, and that those could be many reasons, but of course the most obvious is they could get something for it. Um, you know, there were jobs, there were turkeys, there were favors, there were all sorts of things, many of which aren't really uh, available or even needed anymore in the sense that what Americans now get are policies. You know, they get a, a social benefit or, uh, you know, a, uh, some kind of legislative action. They're not getting uh, personal things. So my question is, in this sort of renovation process, what's in it for the people who are below the level of the gatekeepers? How how do we how do we rebuild the the foundation of a party? Oh, what a what a challenging and interesting point. And yeah, we we do forget that in the heyday of the party system, the parties were very much participatory. You know, torchlight parades and picnics, and yeah, the Thanksgiving turkey and all of that stuff. My uncle. Uh, actually, my late uncle was was one of those people. He was a, a unionist who never missed a meeting of his local democratic club. Um, even when he could barely walk, he would hobble over there. The party was his life. We don't see that anymore. I don't know many people who think that we can go back to, to parties being big grassroots organizers, though I don't know. I'd, I'd love to see it tried. I do know people who understand that the political parties remain a lot more than just the top level elites. Um, when Ray and I took a hard look at the state level parties, and we actually, we surveyed all of them and got responses from like over 50%, which was amazing. We discovered that they still have a fair amount of institutional capacity. No, they cannot do a lot of participatory organizing, but they can still do some. What a lot of them are doing with is teaming up with um, party auxiliary groups like Move On or Indivisible on the Democratic side or the Chamber of Commerce on the Republican side who are doing some of the local grassroots organizing for them. Now that's problematic because these outside groups are dual use technologies and they can turn against the party at a moment's notice. They're accountable to themselves and not the party, but that's what the parties were doing to try to rebuild grassroots capacity. Um, Ray and I argue that some of the little of this weakness at least could be addressed if we untie the party's hands, make it easier for them to raise money, um, which is very, very hard for them to do right now. If you read a paper we wrote on state parties, it's the Brookings website, you'll see some of the, the absurd regulations they live under that just don't make any sense. And, in 2020. Uh, so I guess where I'm coming from on that is we're probably not going to see the return of, of party torchlight parades, but there's still a lot that can be, there's a lot of structure there below the top level, and there's a lot that can be done to reinflate it. Andrew, you get the last question. Well, thank you very much. And this has been an incredibly interesting conversation. So thanks for pulling us all together and for leading it. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm coming at this more from a uh, professional practitioner standpoint than a, than a theor uh, theoretical one. So I'm trying to think about how my, or my own organization uh, interacts with some of these dynamics. So, um, but I, What's your organization? I run a group called Foreign Policy for America. 
and we're an outside organization, you know, with uh, ambitions to growing very large, like a League of Conservation Voters or, you know, uh, NARAL, Planned Parenthood, that sort of thing. Um, but to support principled American engagement in the world, you know, just the bipartisan 70 year tradition of internationalism. And so, you, you know, we're acting as an outside organization, but in service of, um, you know, seriousness and moderation, um, to use a term that everybody gets on board with except Shadi, I guess. Um, but <laughs> my, my question for you is, I see the, di you know, you said something that is striking. You said the system discriminates against moderates right now. And it struck me that um, the dynamics of competition are very different, to, you know, for candidate recruitment, for, you know, building support for fundraising, whether you're a House candidate, a Senate candidate, or presidential. So I just wanted to ask you if you see distinctions in the competitive dynamics among those different um, aspirants for, for public office and, and how that plays into your thesis. So what were the groups again, House, Senate, and was in it the presidential? White House. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. And again, not something I've, I've studied in enough detail to give a competent answer. My impression, <clears throat> but it's only an impression, would probably be that the higher you go in the food chain toward the presidency, the more you tend to attract celebrity candidates, um, people with lots of money, multi-billionaires, because as we saw with Trump running for president, he, he never expected to win. He thought he was promoting his brand and he was right. Um, my sense would be that at the county commissioner level, there's probably less of that. But in the bigger picture, um, if you pull away from the differentiations, what I'm reading and hearing, and the scholarship on this, on this suggests that at most levels, we've seen a movement over the past 20 or 30 years to selection by um, relatively extremist activists and away from party establishments. Um, so I think that's probably the big picture problem, but, but I really, I actually don't know the answer to your question about how you differentiate between levels. Are you asking because you have a hypothesis? Well, I'm just thinking it through, you know, I, with the house currently sort of at play, you know, it's close enough that it could be flipped either way. I don't see, you know, I think there's a, there's a very strong incentive to recruiting moderates and getting moderates to run. And, and so I don't see a discrimination against moderates and the House candidates. I, I will say that um, wherever and to whatever extent you see candidates adopting the model of fundraising, that's small dollar online, you know, we, and we have seen a lot of candidates relying more and more on small dollar online fundraising, email blast fundraising. It is very hard um, to create a model where you're going to raise the most amount of money through sort of moderate good governance. Uh, sure. yeah, yeah. And so that does have the effect of generating extremist rhetoric, which can trickle into, you know, extremist policy or, you know, performance. Um, so anyways, it just strikes me as uh, contingent and probably, I think your first point is probably, you know, in the macro sense, right, is the higher the office, the more these dynamics are at play and maybe uh, in the house can be a little less present. Uh, just one a final anecdote, I'm, I'm, you know, thinking about Senate races, you know, the, the most notable uh, example where you're seeing kind of a really, you know, crazy but viable uh, Senate candidates are places where house members are running for Senate. So they've already made it through the guard um, and, and they're, and, and they're taking that same rhetoric and applying it to Senate level politics. But anyways, I'm talking too long. So it's, uh, really interesting to, to hear all your, your thoughts on all these issues. Okay. Jonathan, I don't want to get, uh, I don't want to get on the bad side of Michael, who I know is making uh, dinner in the background. Uh, thank you so much for a great evening. When we see each other the next time, I've got a question for you about Illinois politics, because I think it breaks your uh, model of uh, 
of uh, state parties, but it can wait till then. Illinois, Illinois is a mess. I give you it that. It is a mess, but it's got a very Not strong every... Democratic Party. Anyway, no guarantees in politics. So uh, thank you for having me, and especially, I'm sorry we couldn't get to everyone. It was such a good conversation. Um, I'm, it was an honor to, to be with a, a group of this caliber. I hope you, you can find me through the Brookings website or my own website. I hope you'll feel free to get in touch and continue the conversation. Um, and thank you again. And what a great group tonight. Thank you Amazing all. Amazing group. Time for Thanks, dinner. Craig. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye -bye.